Today I'm in Berlin in order to find out why it's so hard for Germany to take responsibility in Europe and in the world. I'll discuss this with former German Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer, who's an old buddy of mine, and with the current Minister of Defence Ursula von der Leyen. And of course, as always, it's uncut. Joschka. Yoshko, when you hear the world is in a state of unrest, that American politics are dangerous for everyone, Russian politics are dangerous, even Chinese politics, and in the middle of Europe is Germany, and Germany does not actually move at all in terms of foreign policy, except as an economic power. How do you react? Well, you have to take a look at recent German history to understand the difficulties that Germany is facing. When Germany was completely sovereign after 1871, this went twice horribly wrong. Due to their central position in Europe, the Germans did not really know how to handle their sovereignty. And this ended in the First World War and then in World War II, that final disaster. But now we are sovereign. Yes, but with the experience we have difficulties dealing with it alone. Just compare it with France. France has for centuries an unbroken self-projection as a global power. Even if it is no longer one. Even if it is no longer one. Or to go further, an unbroken self-projection as a civilization, With some good reasons. That means a completely different situation. After 1945, Germany drew instinctively the consequence, never again. Not only never again war, not only never again genocide, but also never again world power, never again world politics. The Germans had the insight that we cannot do that, that this brings only misfortune for us and for our neighbours. We focus on the economy. Yes, but... And that was the division of labour that has evolved between the winning power, the USA, and the Federal Republic of Germany. For the hard, for the dirty, sometimes very dirty things, for security issues, the USA is responsible. And it's under this umbrella that we are able to develop our civil strengths. This division of labor is now gone. The economy is also power politics. Yes, but not in the direct sense. Of course, economy means also power, but it's not power politics based on the military. And this division of labor is questioned by Trump. The Germans now face the big problem. They have to, but they really can't. Can't or don't want to? It's both. I would not actually assume that they don't want to, but it's a historical experience that sits deep. I experienced that for the first time during the war in Kosovo that this was not just another debate within the left-wing parties about war or peace, but that this reached all the way to right-wing politicians, especially among the older generation. Bombarding Belgrade was a shock for many. This means that the historical experience is deeply rooted and also the self-perception has been based on this. In this respect, I would say the Germans can't. It's less not wanting because you can actually convince them. I'd like to get back to the economy for a moment. If Germany pursues a particular economic policy in Europe, or let's say imposes one on others, then this is power politics. That's what you can see in the case of Greece. It's not just rational politics. Yes, from both sides, by the way. Yes, not just in a rational way. Of course, this is also power politics but not in the same way as the classical power politics, which is based on military power or even nuclear power. 
No doubt about it. There is a big difference indeed. This is power in the civil sense, which can be very influential and can have far-reaching consequences. I do not deny that, but Germany is located in the centre of Europe, and what we are experiencing now is a rearranging of the world. What steps can Germany take now? I would not recommend Germany to act on its own under any circumstances, but only integrated into Europe, integrated into the Western alliance together with France. This is already developing. Some time ago I would never have thought that today there would be German troops in Mali. I think this is good. It's the right decision and you can't leave it to France alone to lead the fight against terror in West Africa. But is it only a question of military involvement now and then or is there more at stake? No, without Germany there will be no European military power. No European defence? Not just defence, I go further and say no European military power. But we will have to establish one. Just look at our geopolitical situation, Russia in the east, Turkey in the southeast, the Near and Middle East, North Africa, the African continent. Compare this neighbourhood with the neighbourhood of the USA, then you will see the difference. Europe will no longer be able to rely just on the USA without developing their own weight. And this is only possible with Germany and France, under French leadership. Yes, but this French leadership... You can see that France is trying many things, but Berlin does not respond to it. That creates an even greater restlessness because no one knows where the journey is going, the European journey. I think the pressure will come from outside. Berlin is currently in a similar situation as France before the election of Emmanuel Macron a transitional situation. The old West German influence party system is in the process of changing dramatically or even of dissolving itself. This is what we will also experience in the upcoming regional elections. I think the Liberal FDP under its chairman, Lindner, made a terrible mistake. They did not realize that Jamaica was a historical challenge. We have to explain to everyone, Jamaica would be an alliance between the parties CDU, CSU, FDP and the Greens. The combination of these party colors would be the Jamaican flag, black, yellow, green. And we will experience a dramatic change. We are in a transitional phase. The final phase of Angela Merkel has been initiated during the last parliamentary elections. And you can feel that on so many levels. It may be that we will undergo a French development, a reorganization of the party system. If the polls in Bavaria prove to be right and the Greens finish second, the FDP fourth place. To explain, in Bavaria soon there will be state elections taking place in mid-October. That will be very important. And then, 14 days later, a second federal state election follows in Hesse. And then next year the elections in East Germany and the European elections. But when you can feel the division between East and West Germany, and this is not only concerning the strengthening of the right-wing radicals of the AfD, which in the West gain on a rather normal scale, 12-13%, for example, in Hesse or Bavaria. But in the former GDR, part of Germany, where the right-wing radicals are among the strongest parties, with 20 to 25%, is such a divided Germany able to rethink its position and the role it plays in Europe and the world? So positioniert, dass es eine Rolle in ja. Europa und der Welt spielt? Über, überhaupt keine Frage. Yes, no question at all. In the first place, because it has to, Germany cannot take a time out from history and especially not concerning Europe. But we also have to see that in Germany the pan-European division is noticeable. 
The new federal states are closer to Hungary, to the Czech Republic, to Slovakia, to Poland, and to West Germany. Well, that's right, Joschka, but look, remember, before you mentioned the difficulties that the Social Democratic Green Schroeder Fischer government had encountered during the Yugoslavia Kosovo Bosnia conflicts. Yugoslavian, Kosovo, Bosnian. But it worked. This requires strong leadership. Yes, this is always necessary. Yes, and that's the problem in Germany at the moment. That's why I said we're in a transition phase. Yes, but what a transitional phase. But also, frankly, two years ago, no one ever thought of Emmanuel Macron as the president of the French Republic. Emmanuel Macron's been able to create something due to the French constitution. Because of the crisis of the Fifth Republic, the party system was broken. Yes, but you have a system of direct presidential elections there, where you can just jump over the parties. You can't do that today in Germany this easily. No, you won't be able to jump over the parties, but the parties will change their roles. In the Federal Republic, since its foundation in 1949 as a West German Federal Republic, it was normal that the two major people's parties disposed of the chancellery as a monopoly, so to speak, depending on who was ruling the government. And I can well imagine that this will no longer be the case two years from now, because they are no longer the great parties of the people. So we will get a new party system, including the far-right AFD. The AFD has substantially contributed to this change and will continue to do so. I don't think they have any greater potential than 20%. They will be destroyed by their radicalism. They are like many left-wing initiatives, which then broke down because of their radicalization. Right now, they're still gaining votes, but that won't last. But they will contribute to the change of the party system. If you were foreign affairs minister now, I know you don't want it, but if you were, what would be the two, three steps where you say Germany must show clear positions? So if I were foreign minister, I would move heaven and hell to go towards France and to bring Europe up to speed. That is the most important thing. We're experiencing the development of a new world order with a focus on the East Asia Pacific. The transatlantic dimension will decrease. Europe, all megatrends, all global trends, technology, demographics, everything, power distribution, a showing decline. We're in real danger of being lost. We still have exactly one chance, not one more, and that is why for me Europe is the central key question, the be-all and end-all, that would be the absolute. So there's no second and no third point? No, no. Our relationship with America, the future of the West, will depend on whether the Europeans manage to unite. And that will depend to a large extent on Germany and France. So for me, this would be the central point. First and second and third. In this context, you speak, let's say, of the power political necessity to develop a European strategy. This seems to be happening without England because I don't see at the moment how Brexit can be stopped. The geopolitical situation is not going to change, neither for the English nor for us. I think Brexit is a great tragedy. Unnecessary, just like a hole in your head. You really don't need it, but it's reality and it will put additional pressure on the continental Europeans. But we should not forget the geopolitical situation does not change. There is life after divorce. You know that. I know this too well. And when in a divorce proceeding, it's wise to always be aware of that. From a former foreign minister to the current Minister of Defence in Germany, responsible for defence policy. 
Frau Ministerin. Minister, visibly the multilateral world is in disorder. We've seen it recently in the United Nations. The American president says America, America, America. The Russians say Russia, 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 the Chinese too. And everyone is now looking at Europe, and in Europe to Germany. How can, how should Germany actually take responsibility? Two or three years ago, all of us in the federal government made it clear that it's time for Germany to take more responsibility and do so on a broad basis. And when I say more responsibility, then I don't mean only an economically strong country, a politically influential country, but that we must also be prepared to take more responsibility in those areas where there's no applause, where there are crises and conflicts. This is then broken down into various skills that need to be developed in diplomacy, in development cooperation, but also in the military. And we're right in the middle of this process. We're shedding a skin. That's a process of change for Germany. But I believe that 25 years after reunification, the time is right. I'd like to come back to that phrase, shedding your skin. I think this is very good. There are many layers in Germany to skin, because after 1945, the motto was never again war. We make the economy, we make peace, we make hospitals. But this hardware, this defense or security policy, it's better for the others to do that. And that is what we've left to the Americans and a little to the English and the French. Yes, I know this argument, which in the past had often been used and which had been correct for a long time. Because of our history, we stay out of it. But in the position in which Germany finds itself today, right in the middle of Europe, we must actually say, because of our history, we also have to be involved in the globalized world and stand up for our shared values. One example, three years ago, when ISIS took Mosul and attempted a genocide against the Yazidi. Then Germany said precisely because of its history, for the first time since World War II, we're ready to send weapons to a war zone and to train and equip the Peshmerga over there so that they're able to defend the Yazidi and their homeland. This is an example of a broader approach, which we must and want to take, and are on the way of taking. It's not always straight, it's often bumpy, sometimes two steps forward and one back, but the direction is right. Yes, but I'd like to talk about this again. Let's take, for example, France. The French say we're sending security forces. We're also sending specialists, for example, to help the Kurds. Germany, on the other side, weapons, yes, these are sometimes necessary. But as we've seen with Yugoslavia, Germany is still having trouble with that. Also, with humanitarian interventions, interventions to save people. Why is that, or better, how do you make progress on that matter in Germany? The fact that we're having difficulty is an important and good thing. These are not easy decisions to take. And my experience of the past years is also that step by step, we have to accept this responsibility with increasing intensity. This is not a process where you just have to pull a lever and everything changes. Instead, it's always connected with intense arguments and discussions. However, it's a good path to take, the right one, because a lot is at stake, and it's a matter of great responsibility to bear. But I will make one point. If we do commit ourselves, then Germany's presence is also characterized by being reliable and sustainable sustainable. So according to my experience, it doesn't make any sense to act at short notice, even with military strength, and then pull out quickly. It's wiser to put the local forces in a position to defend their homeland or to fight terror and to remain there for a long time in what we call a networked approach, and then for many years to provide reconstruction and to achieve reconciliation. But didn't that also fail a little in Afghanistan? I don't mean only Germany's intervention, I don't want to say that at all. But in general, the attempt to build something up in Afghanistan doesn't seem to have worked.
In Afghanistan, das ist ein klassisches Beispiel dafür, dass die Afghanistan is a classic example of the fact that the time periods of the processes we're talking about are long. You can argue about whether in Afghanistan the local population and the security forces have been sufficiently involved from the beginning. You can argue about this. Today, I see that in this exhausting process, which has lasted for years, we're step by step enabling the Afghan government and the security forces, which is set up very differently, to on the one hand fight the Taliban and on the other hand find a common solution with those who are willing to talk. This long process, we always have to explain it to our populations. When such terrible wars have taken place, as in Afghanistan or in Syria now, and whole generations have profound scars from it, then it also takes almost a whole generation for the healing process. But have we not all failed in Syria? We have. This civil war has been raging for many, many years. For a long time, we didn't want to look at it. And then, when ISIS appeared as part of the coalition against terror, we fought against ISIS. Because ISIS was actually acting in Europe. Also because they acted here. But we had started it in Iraq. I've described the situation with the Yazidi. ISIS had occupied two-thirds of Iraq. In Iraq, we did a lot of things right. Today, ISIS is militarily beaten in Iraq. But the world community must still help to stabilize the situation there for years. In Syria, we felt very clearly that the vacuum the Americans had left behind was filled by Russia and Europe was not there at all. This is also a bitter lesson for Europe, that the problems which appeared there, the civil war that has raged, if we don't deal with this on the spot, it lands directly at our front door. In this respect, in Syria, in the long term, we did not manage to convince Russia to fight ISIS with us. But for the future of Syria, I also see that Russia is aware of the fact, together with Assad, that it will take us, Americans, Europeans, to rebuild this country. That means there's also the chance to say, only if a political solution in Syria is reached, which also gives the people who fled, meaning the opposition of Assad, the right to return to Syria and a space to live. Talking about Syria in recent weeks, you've developed, I will not say an initiative, but a remarkable thought. You said that if now Assad were to use chemical weapons in the fighting again, Germany would not be able to stay out or could not just leave it to France or the United States. That was something that many in your party and also within the Social Democrats did not like. In the decisive moment it seems that many people say, yes, yes, the others should do that. Now they say that the French should do it. And this is why this discussion is so important to us. This is a skinning process that goes on for many years. Namely, what I'm demanding is, chemical weapons are the absolute horror and rightly outlawed for decades. We, the world community, if we're to take ourselves seriously, we must enforce this ban and protect people. This means for Germany that I'm asking to not say right from the start that we're not part of this. What fatal signal is this to Assad if no matter what Assad does, we're not there to intervene? And that's why I demand that we allow ourselves a space for discussion, because we still don't know what will happen, and that we insist on prevention, we keep all the options on the table, so that the international community takes the ban on chemical weapons seriously and enforces it. Now let's change the topic and let's talk about NATO's security architecture. The Americans, I'm not saying they're leaving NATO, but they're taking less and less responsibility. This means that within NATO, Europe will play a greater role, and then one speaks of a European defence. How far advanced is the thinking that one day there will be a European army? 
I'm firmly convinced that we're always going to need NATO for collective defense. Article 5, this will always be NATO. That's why it's important for me to remain transatlantic. Despite the difficulties that exist at the moment. Yes, we have to discuss them thoroughly and we have to endure these discussions. I know that together we're standing on a secure foundation of values. But the American president is who he is. And this discussion, how do we actually live up to our values and what do we have in common and what do we have to defend? These discussions must be conducted very energetically. And we still must become more European, because I see many areas where NATO is not in demand. For example, the whole Africa topic, where the European Union is very much in demand. Because NATO has existed for decades, we didn't build security structures for a European defense union worthy of the name. In the last one and a half years, we tackled this and we took a big step forward. The structures that have been sleeping for a long time inside the Treaty of Lisbon have now been launched. That means we have a legal framework for the European Defence Union. We have a joint planning process so that as Europeans we can also develop a structure for when we're going to use our forces. The French president wants a proper education, European training or at least a Franco-German one. So that, let's say, a common military culture is strengthened it's important and right that we do the German-French thing together. Without the French, we would not have been able to launch the European Defence Union, which is now making great progress. And a common strategic culture means that we sit down together, constantly analyzing the various situations, just as we did with Syria and Iraq, but also looking at Africa, to evaluate also what we could do and to consider together at an early stage what can be done and what instruments we have. But with Brexit, is it not more difficult to have a common defense without the English? Or how is that supposed to happen, supposing that the Brexit is carried out? Since we had almost nothing in the past in terms of defence in the European Union, we do not need to separate anything with Brexit, actually. That was bitter in the past. We're building the European Defence Union from scratch. In NATO, we're close to the British and work together, and our British friends also positioned themselves very clearly by saying it's quite possible that we'll be participating in European missions because it's also in our interest. For us as Europeans, it's crucial that we harmonize our very fragmented forces so that together we have what we call interoperability and a rapid response capacity. We can do that right now. When you were asking for a European army, I believe the term we form an army of Europeans is the right one for the current situation. In other words, that we're so closely linked that we can also go into action immediately. And I'll give you an example. The Dutch have put their last tank battalion in Germany under our control. It integrates into the German tank corps, and we have integrated parts of our navy into the Dutch one. We're different and will remain different, but we're growing so close in these parts of the armed forces that we work closely together and look at the globalized problems where we also have the common interest to solve them together wo wir das gemeinsame Interesse haben, sie gemeinsam auch zu lösen. Let's take Mali as our last example. In the beginning, it was a bit business as usual. It was decided that intervention should take place. The French went there, the Germans built hospitals. Now things are a little different. Why is it not possible for the Franco-German brigade to intervene in such an operation? Because that's why this brigade was educated and trained, right? Yes, you're right. The good news is the Franco-German brigade will now go in late autumn to Mali 
and leads the European training mission. So we use them and we also have to do a better job in these joint activities. But this also means both sides sit at one table. No one asserts themselves 100%. But with the particularities of both countries, we must work together to analyze, decide and then act. Last question. Are you optimistic that in the near future we will be able to achieve our goals in terms of safety, common defense and security structures and build them up faster. I'm very optimistic because I've observed the last one and a half years. While around us in Europe there were many problems and ruptures, it's been the one area where we've made the most progress. Altogether, because all of us felt that we, as Europeans, must work together to tackle the problems at our door, no one will help us there anymore. We've made tremendous progress, and because we're so consensual and proceeded so fast, it has has not stirred up any big dust, but it's been well carried forward, so we should go on like this. Madam Minister, thank you very much for the interview. That was Uncut number three, this episode about Germany, Germany and the future architecture of security in Europe, with the former German Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer and the current German Minister of Defence, Mrs. von der Leyen. Thank you very much.